Before talking about specific policies on race, there are a lot of underlying beliefs that go into policy that need to be dealt with. Whether they believed it or not, since the mid-1960s, most of what we call the West has embarked on programs of open immigration and racial integration that are based on the idea that there are no significant innate differences in the brain between the races. Physical, superficial differences, fine, but the brain is off limits. 50 plus years on, the policies that come from this outlook have had a failure rate of 100%. In the United States, whites pay on net about 2,800 more in taxes than they get in government services. Blacks on that receive about 10,000 more in government than they pay in taxes, and Hispanics receive about 7,300 more in government than they pay in taxes. Even if we remove their share of the military budget and assign all military spending to whites, whites would still on net pay $1,260 more in taxes than they get from government. And even when assigning all military spending to whites, the blacks and Hispanics still contribute $598 billion to the budget deficit in 2014, which is to say the annual budget deficit of the United States is entirely a function of the black and Hispanic population. And there is zero evidence that the presence of black and Hispanics in any area increases white wages in that area. Having these people doesn't bump up white wages. I haven't investigated the fiscal impact of Arabs and Africans in continental European countries in detail, but all indicators point to them being a similar financial effect. Hillary Clinton had a slush fund foundation where she took money from foreign governments and large companies in exchange for influence. This kind of transparent buying of government by the powerful is rare in Western Europe, problematic in Eastern Europe, common in Latin America, and the norm in Africa, and this almost won, even though whites voted for Trump 58 to 37 percent. And if not for the Electoral College, which indirectly gives rural white voters power over brown urban voters, she would have won. The economic gaps between the races are the same everywhere, all throughout Latin America. Whites are somewhere at the top, mestizos, Amerindians in the middle, and the few blacks in these countries at the bottom. There is not a single country where this rank order differs. So the idea of a functional multiracial state so far has failed all tests. Racial integration just does not happen. So far, at least, the brute fact is that when you import the third world, you become the third world. Given this 100% failure rate, you would think it's time to reevaluate the underlying assumption of equality. It's a very strange assumption. First of all, you can tell someone's genetic ancestry just from looking at the shape of their brain. From a paper in Current Biology entitled Modeling the 3D Geometry of Cortical Surface with Genetic Ancestry, the, the authors write, quote, our data indicate that the unique folding patterns of Jarai and Sulkai are closely aligned with genetic ancestry. The geometry robustly predicts each individual's genetic, genetic background, even though the population has been shaped by waves of migration and admixtures. A paper in Biomed entitled Different Level of Population Differentiation Among Human Genes found that the genes involved with the pituitary gland, neural column patterning, hindbrain development, regulation of neuron differentiation, and neuron development had higher levels of population ancestry differentiation than pigmentation, i.e. skin color meaning the genes involved in neuron development, or at least some of them, have more racial differentiation than skin color. So given that you can tell someone's race by the shape of their brain, and that several genes known to influence neuron development differ by race more than the genes regulating skin color do, this makes the idea of equality of cognitive traits hard to just assume. Just yesterday, a paper was published showing that you can predict someone's big five personality traits just by looking at the shape and folding patterns of their brain. Lots of people have problems with IQ tests. Now, first off, IQ is a better predictor of job performance and lifetime income than education level is, okay? People use education level all the time to explain differences between groups and things. Well, IQ is actually better than that. IQ is also a good indicator of how smart someone is perceived to be. And more importantly, in group settings, the longer the interaction, the closer the relation between IQ and perceived intelligence is. The cultural bias argument on IQ tests is something that intelligence researchers, at least on surveys, don't take seriously at all. Racial gaps are smaller on arithmetic, verbal intelligence, and information tests than they are on the more abstract visual, spatial, and reasoning tests. Panels where experts pick what they think are culturally biased questions, on average, pick questions with smaller racial gaps than the overall test, and that includes that infamous saucer question. IQ tests also predict life outcomes similarly for racial groups, so their bias, these IQ tests, would have to line up uh, fairly precisely with the rest of society. 
Sur uh, two surveys of intelligence researchers, one from 1984, one from 2013, found that the median intelligence researcher thinks that the racial IQ gaps are about 50% down to genetics. Now, I think it's 80%, so I'm out of the mainstream, but it's just a matter of degree. Globally, the IQ gaps between races within countries match their economic standing, and they are the same everywhere. Blacks in the United Kingdom have an average IQ of 86, blacks in the U.S. around 85, Mixed race populations have IQs intermediate between their racial compositions, all right, between the races they are composed of. Not only are their overall IQs intermediate, but the pattern is intermediate. For example, Europeans do better on verbal IQ tests than East Asians do, but East Asians do better overall on the, on the rest of the IQ test. But mixed Europeans, East, uh, mixed European East Asian hybrids, or HAPAs, have higher verbal IQs than East, than East Asians, but lower verbal IQs than Europeans, but their overall IQ is between Europeans and East Asians. So not only is the overall score intermediate, but the pattern is intermediate. Poverty doesn't make much sense as an explanation, given that the bottom fifth of whites economically have higher IQs and SATs than the top fifths of blacks economically, and Eastern European countries, whose white populations have lower purchasing powers than U.S. blacks or Hispanics, have IQs in the high 90s, sometimes as, as high as 100. In addition, Genes for intelligence are beginning to be found. However, the molecular genetics information is something very complicated, and I will just have to outsource to an article on the all-type. There's no way to cover everything here, but we have articles on, on stereotype threats, stress, nutrition, breastfeeding, lead exposure, school quality, adoption studies, and many other things, and I'm certainly happy to talk about those things in the Q&A portion. But these overall differences, uh, these overall numbers, you know, as big as they are, is a very crude, gross way to look at this. Whites do better on the more difficult IQ test questions and on the more abstract questions. If you had an IQ test that just had the top 25% most difficult questions and that was limited to the more abstract questions, right, such as matrices, object assembly, and object orientation, stuff like that, and basic more abstract reasoning questions, the gap would be 27 points, not 15 points. The result being that there is far less overlap on these kinds of abstract and difficult questions and even less overlap intergenerationally due to a phenomenon known as regression to the mean, where on average, each generation of exceptionally bright or dim members of a racial group regress about halfway back to their racial mean, okay? And this fact has actually been used by creationists to argue against evolution, but it doesn't regress all the way and it only happens once for any individuals. Moreover, as Putnam and many replications of Putnam's work has shown, Racial diversity decreases social trust and makes people less happy within a society, causes them more often to bowl alone, as is the title of his work. Even those individuals or even groups like East Asians who have high IQs and are not a financial drain, maybe even a financial benefit, will still vote differently than whites voting for liberally, liberal or really what we should call third worldist policies that are antithetical to the legalized monogamy, strict property laws, and consistent application of laws and that don't favor swings in public sentiment or popular figures. Now, for now, you can imagine that these political differences between groups are totally down to non-genetic factors. Well, that's a bit speculative. We know with twin studies that about half of the variation within the whole population on political views is about 50% down to genetics. So to just assume that the race differences in political views, right, which are the same everywhere, blacks in Britain vote labor, blacks in Canada vote liberal, Hispanics vote communists wherever they are. That's a bit of an exaggeration. But to say that these are totally environmental is pure speculation. And whether the political differences are environmental or genetic and in what proportions is an ap academic question today. Because right now, nobody has shown a proven way to change the views of these groups to be more in One line minute. with the unique classical liberalism that distinguishes white European peoples. In real terms, I'm talking about the people who would vote for Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. That's third world. That's the death of the West. Right now, race differences and political views are acting as if there's something like 80% genetic and basically fixed, even if perhaps technically there is a higher proportion that is environmental and malleable. We don't need to be having an on-case policy discussion, and we, don't need, and we certainly don't need to be having any kind of philosophical discussion about race until we have established what it is we're even talking about. 